people try to do that and just it's very pretentious and also the music is still going <laughs> okay so this is okay and they desaturated it and you're sad but um, <laughs> but i think you know um i mean they knew coming in like iron man was very funny robert's very funny and humor had been part of it so it wasn't like i was like let's try this it wasn't insane like taika who <laughs> just went off the rails Damn, you were full Taika. <laughs> when, when you just told that story about the, the, the composer, uh, Taika has a great expression when he goes, I don't, want, I don't want one of those scores where it sounds like the composer fell asleep on the keyboard. <laughs> that was a great way of putting it. It's a great thing about Silvestri, too, is because he's very old school, he can give you something memorable, but also lightly play the moment. So well, I love that he does themes, because I feel like that's, big, you know, except for some of the recent Star Wars movies, some of you guys, it, that's gotten lost. It's a lot of, like, mood things and whatever, as opposed to, like, great, okay, I know now it's this character, and it's their, their theme, and Loki has a theme, and all that kind of stuff. It's hard. It's hard, especially when there's six people. Right. Like, we're not going to have the Hawkeye Waltz. <laughs> <It's the same. laughs> um, uh, but, um, but I think it's so important. I very much, once upon a time in the West, is an ur text for me. It's like that's you know the most the greatest use of theme. The hero plays his own theme because of his tragic backstory. For fuck's sake, that is just <laughs> the best the best use ever. But I think it really does help people, especially when there's a lot to sort of go okay. But when you find I know this person, I know what space I'm in, and and it's nice when two people come together and you've got two things that can have a little undercurrent. But it's you also find there isn't, at some point, you just have to go, oh, 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 like you have to get action in here, excited, or whatever, like you do have to, it's hard to find places to let a theme sit, because you're not gonna, it's not, you know, you're not gonna be looking at a wheat field for 30 seconds while, you know, somebody riffs, so it's, um, you have to sort of get it in there, and that's where Alan was so great, because he knows how to find his moment and use the very few seconds he's got perfect. I, I remember when the movie came out, reading some quote that you you said that when you were making this, you wanted to feel like it played like a rock concert. Do you remember? Uh, no? Uh, no, it sounds cool, so I definitely said it. Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you uh, what you meant by that. A thought. rock concert used to be a thing where... Um, <laughs> no, all right. Um, the, the, uh, well, one of the things that... It's, there's something that, that the comics always did, but you never really saw movies before this movie, is heroes fighting each other. Like I think that you're used to heroes fighting the villains, and I feel like that's it's become more commonplace now. But that kind of started with this movie. Of like, you know, it's like, all right, you have a scene where you have three of your heroes fighting each other. Um, well, that was, I mean, was that was that oh something yeah. that right away they were like, okay, Loki's the villain. This the it, the climax is in New York, alien invasion, and they gotta fight each other. Like that was that was what we had for sure. And I and I think it's sort of right. I think they did that in the comics all the time too. Do you want to talk about that, Kevin? No, I mean, yeah, it was in the comics, and it was, and that was always the, the fun part. And seeing, because they don't, it's what Josh said earlier. They have no business being in the same movie together. Who they don't know who these, who these people are. When we announced that Monday after Iron Man one opened, and and there was that bit of cynicism about we're going to do Iron Man two, and then and then. Uh, and then Thor and the Captain and Avengers, people were like, how is Thor going to go into this? How are you going to put all these people together? Um, so that was always the, the fun part, was those initial meetings when, when they, they do that. Like, who the, hell, who the hell are you? And when we, there were two moments on this one when you have that synergy. One was the first time Ryan Meinerding, our brilliant head of uh, visual development artist, drew that image of all of them together for the first time, which now is on a giant wall in a post uh, uh, building in, uh, on the Disney lot. And it was the first time you'd, you'd seen any of them with the actors' faces in the same frame. And then it was in Joss's boards, and then later, later in those initial dailies, of Cap and Iron Man and Thor together in the woods for the first time in a single frame. Uh, and that's it's when I knew this is gonna, this is pretty, this is, there's a chemical reaction that happens when you see this. That is pretty awesome, at least for me. Yeah. Look, I got excited when Murder She Wrote and Magnum did a crossover. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know what somebody told me about the other day? This is true. I think it's true. I was talking to a journalist about crossovers, and he said, You guys are not going to get either of these references. But the old, 
Boss Hog from Dukes of Hazard showed up in Mel's diner oh, from Alice. Alice, oh, everybody! Okay. What? And, and Alice was a, was not a, true. Was a sitcom. It was a situation was comedy. True. And I, I, I remember that episode because I love Dukes of Hazard and Alice. And I was like, it was so weird though to have like someone come from like a single camp thing and then go into like a multi camp. It blows my mind. I haven't seen it. They sent it on YouTube. Go check it out. <laughs> Dude, all right, a show of hands. Have any of you watched Deuce of Hazard or Alice? All right, there you go. Wow. Was yeah, anyone besides me seeing this episode? Oh yeah, all right, okay. I was anyway, on, I was I so was excited as a kid. As a kid, because my dad wrote for it. Your dad wrote for which one? Alice. Oh wow, I love that one. Which was based on a Martin Scorsese movie. What's That's right, Alice doesn't live here anymore. Yeah. Very different. <laughs> <laughs> there was not a last track, I think, in the Scorsese version. Um, so let's, speaking of action, I, I think the last 45 minutes of this movie is my favorite third act of, really, I'll say any movie. Um, I, the, I mean, the, the action sequence is just absolutely amazing, and the, the fact that you guys kept it going and kept it interesting and balanced all the different characters is just incredible. Do you guys want to talk about sort of putting together that sequence and, and especially that, that one shot that is amazing, like, like whose idea was that to sort of follow all the different heroes like through the... Was it the director writer, Josh Wheat? I said, well, this is a rock concert. This is when we play Freebird. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, and I don't talk like that. Let me find a quote. But, but, uh, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, if, come on. Why, yes, of course, you want to do that. It was, the, it was so hard. It took so long, and so many shots combined, and we had to pass off and try to figure it out. And it was the last shot we rendered. Um, and... Uh, and there was a very serious discussion about not having it because it was killing us. So well, it was it was actually it was a few shots stitched together. They were they were rendered in separate pieces, and then they had no. We, we did it practically. <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, the, the at some point it was it was it was becoming so difficult that there was there was some talk about like let's try to we'll break it up. We can make it work. And I remember uh, Josh having this conversation. It's like. That's the moment, more so than even the roundy round, I think, that where, where the camera circles them all, where you finally, they finally get to perform together, uh, to doing what they all do. And, and to not have it interrupted, I think, is the, that's a huge thing to have happen. And it's not just a, a theoretical thing or, or a stylistic thing. It, it changes the way you feel about that, the moment in the movie. And it's, it's the moment when the team coalesces. And I think, I'm glad that, that you stood up for it and we, and we, and we, we kept it, uh, in. And when it, when it was finally finished, it was, you know, uh, there were so many flaws at the end, and we had to sort of say, that's it, that, it's a final, uh, like you always do, and, and now I look at it, I don't see them anymore. But I remember it was like, we... Oh yeah, no, we were like, oh, this is not ready. Yeah, this is not going to work. We, nice. But good work, everybody. But, you know, <laughs> just, you know, we fought, but we you know, won the yard line, and then the clock ran out, we didn't. But the, the, the punch at the end of it is that, I mean, that, that, that works because of that build up too, just for that, just that moment, which is great when all the punches. It uh, wasn't me, I, it might have been Lisa, certainly like you, very, there were many times on both <laughs> movies where I was like, sure, we could test, got it, I mean, I guess, and Jeff and Lisa would be still awake somehow. <laughs> Jeff who has not ceased cutting a Marvel movie. I don't, have you eaten in the last 10 years? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Um, and they would be like, uh, she, I think she was just like, isn't this why you make the movie? Isn't this the entire raison d'etre of this? Is this is the shot where they're a team, very as you said specifically, and uh, and also it. Uh, one of the things about the fight that was very important to me, that was very hard to maintain, that I give Jeff a huge amount of credit for is is that um, I really wanted to be um, clear about the space be coherent about observing the unities. They are here, and you get from here to here. And uh, for me, I think that helps enormously. We have a long action sequence that you're not just cutting to some guy and suddenly he's behind this pillar shooting and this easement. You'd like to try as much as possible to, to do the shoe leather. And that, you know, we, we, had, we had mapped out, we'd flown around the area. And we, so all of that is placed more or less exactly where it would be. Um, like we figured out where we would need to get the camera for them to be flying towards Grand Central for the last bit. Like it just, and I think that's you know that also sort of it lets people keep enjoying it. Well, Josh said also you'd broken that out, you had scripted it, but then also broken it out as its own. Like what was like a five act, six act, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, point sheet for boards right. and for the whole story of just that 
those 45 minutes. Five acts. It's, I mean, that never gets boring. I mean, I think, I think that's the amazing thing about it that I love it. I'm, I'm such a fan of the classics for Spielberg Lucas build a set piece action scene where you sort of let it play. And one, one of my pet peeves about a lot of modern movies, and this obviously didn't do that, is it becomes so cutty and like you want to keep the frenetic pace of it, but you have no sense of geography. And I, I think what's so amazing is you're in the city and you have all these different things, but like I, I, always, I never felt lost. Like I, I felt like I knew what everyone was doing and stuff and, and where we were at, and you used a lot of longer shots as opposed to a lot of like close ups and stuff. And it's just, well, it's really brilliant. There's a design element to the writing and, and the direction of it also over the course of the movie. You're educated to Stark Tower, it's centered here. You meet it early in the movie as a geographic object that then is the center point of the battle. The Selvig's device starts from the top of the tower. So all those things are subliminally kind of helping you out, and that that you know, and having the viaduct as a central central point for it too. I mean, that's the design of it was very good from from the get go. So it wouldn't have been able to do it without those things in place. I think I I would say that um, I'll take all the credit I can get. Look, I've had I've had a rough year. I'd like some credit. So. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, but honestly, I would say if there is a word I would use besides um, humorous and hu I would, and humanist, the word I would use about Marvel movies as a whole is coherent, like visually coherent. You know what you're seeing, and, and that is something that, you know, when I wanted movies about comic books, I wanted to be able to see a guy really jump that high and go through the window and go to the and do the next thing. And, um, and so that's sort of very cutting, what the hell's going on, but it's very exciting. Action doesn't, doesn't work for comics, and certainly there have been comics with artists who are great, like, it could draw beautifully, but you don't, your eye doesn't know where to go. There are a lot of those guys, like, in the aughts. And, uh, um, and uh, but the Marvel style, the classic Marvel style, was like, you knew exactly where to look. And so those, you know, in Iron Man, and Thor, I think in all the movies, you know, you get the, you get what's going on in the action. And I think that's, uh, and it's sort of become a lost art a little bit. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, well, let's let's talk about the biggest laugh in the movie, um, which always was amazing seeing with the crowd, which is the uh, Hulk uh, Loki moment, where Loki's about to give another big long speech, and yeah, do you want to talk about coming up with that? I think we, um, you know, uh, it, honestly, it just seemed like the the thing he would do. <laughs> and by the way, I did again. I think Tom Hiddleston's greatest moment is in Thor 3, when he's like, I have to get off this planet right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is hilarious, I feel so seen. Because um, I had forgotten. <laughs> that was the last time. But, um, uh, you know, it was, it was one of those things where I was like, it feels right, and I think Brian, um, our storyboard artist, um, who's you know, he did a great part of bark, 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 bark. Like, his stuff is very cartoony because he's pitching gags all the time, so he does like really fast pencil things. Like, plow smoke, plow smoke, plow smoke. And, uh, um, and there, was some, there was some pushback. Um, there, were, there, were, uh, there were other uh, voices involved at the time, uh, some of whom were like, you can't mean our villain like that, they'll never take him seriously again. <laughs> and then, and then we, and, I thought it was pretty cool. It had been in the script since Joss had written it. Uh, but you always, you, you people are adamant about something. You want to you know, think about it. And you go, well, maybe, but I don't know. It seems pretty funny. We had an animatic uh, made, a previous of it, rough previous done. And we were shooting a, a scene in, uh, in uh, Albuquerque where we shot the movie. And Josh was filming this other scene. And somebody came by with a laptop to, to show him to get approval for this most recent incarnation of the previous of Hulk smashing Loki. And Mark Ruffalo's son happened to be there. You remember this? I forgot about his, that. His, I don't remember at the time, 10-year-old son happened to be there and was, and was looking at it and lost his mind <laughs> when he saw it. He just started laughing. He wanted to show, he play it again and again. And I, and it, I went, it's in the movie. <laughs> Um, well, this movie, this movie was a phenomenon, and, and it really it, it did change Hollywood. Everyone was trying to emulate it. W when did you guys? Because all of your movies before this, Kevin, and have been hits. But then, what was amazing about this is like they all did this, and then this is this. You know, when when did you guys get an inkling that that maybe it was going to be that, that that this was working so well that it was just going to explode? Well, my biggest fear was that it would uh, not do as well as Iron Man Two. Iron Man Two at the time was our biggest 
movie, I think 600 something worldwide. And, uh, and I thought, won't it be embarrassing if the movie, our big like, ta-da, and it doesn't do as much as, as the one with, with one guy in it. And, uh, and on opening night, Justin and I were just talking about this outside, uh, Jeremy and Jeremy Latcham and Justin and I went to the Bruin in Westwood to see the Midnight Show. Jeff was at the El Capitan at the Midnight Show. And, and Jeff and Jeremy started texting each other, like, people seem to like it, seem, people seem to really like it. And they were reacting to everything, even laughs that we had forgotten even existed in the movie. And, when, and I swear to God, this, was, this really happened, and it was like a moment out of a, out of a cheesy, cheesy movie. But as the movie ended right after Shawarma, everyone pours out into the lobby of the Bruin, and it's a big bottleneck to get in. So we were just waiting, and people recognized Joss. And the entire hundreds of people in this packed lobby started cheering for him and parted so that we could get out. And I went, oh, this movie's going to work. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, Kevin, I imagine it's probably be hard for you to answer, but for you guys, uh, of the movies you didn't work on, wh wh what are your other favorite Marvel movies? Like off the top of your head, what's... I, I'm waiting for these guys to fuck up. I mean, <laughs> it's like, you like to feel like, well, I'm necessary. They can't do without me. And then, like, just... Um, Ragnarok just made me so happy. I, 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 tried to, I tried to think of the, a time I had felt like that. And um, I was like, I got to Star Wars and South Park. Where I was like, I was in the hands of something so assured and it was never gonna stop being that funny. And that blew me away. Black Panther, being at the premiere of Black Panther was fucking insane too. So it was just like, because it was great and it was a delight and everybody knew things are different now. Um, and that's like, that energy of like, oh, there's social change. Kids are gonna see this and they're gonna look at themselves differently, like that feeling. Um, to have that while you're just enjoying a really good superhero flick uh, is, is just amazing. I mean, honestly, it's just, I, I, I haven't really been a dud, guys. And, and, and I, I mean, I guess they didn't they, they, <laughs> None of it would happen without Joss Whedon. Uh, None of it. Who's that? Who's that? You got? Well, I, I got a second of Ragnarok. I love that movie. Woo! That is so good. And I will also, I mean, for, for my money, Iron Man 1 is a damn good movie. And it's like, I still watch it now. Um, and, and marvel at how, no pun intended, how brilliantly it's made. And those, the two of them in that movie, uh, Gwyneth and, and Robert, it just is, it's, uh, it's amazing, just amazing, it's, it's great, it holds up. I think that, you know, when you're like, what is Kevin great at? Um, definitely have, we have to talk about casting. Yeah. Because yeah. there was, you know, you hired the prettiest, you know, muscle guy you could find to be your hero, that was the drill, and I, the only time I've ever done this was with that uh, restaurant, I saw Kevin, and it had just been announced that they were casting Downey, which was a big deal and kind of a, a, a lateral move and kind of risky. And I was just like, dude, uh, I'm so excited. That's so cool. And, you're, I, and you kept, you know, Kevin was like, it's the first decision I got to make myself. <laughs> it's the first one I got to say, no, we're going to do this. And the fact that Gwyneth came on just elevated, like, no one, she's going to play the girl in a superhero movie? Like, then, you know, it's like, oh, they're, they actually are writing roles for these people and they're, and they're showing up. And of course, Bridges and, and it just, uh, like, it elevated what the movie could be, and they leaned into it. They leaned into the fact that they had great actors. They didn't just, you know, you, sometimes you see them and you're like, oh, it's great that you made this thing based on a video game for a uh, paycheck in Bratislava on your vacation. But uh, it didn't at all. Like, they, made, they were like, we're going to make a film about Iron Man that still feels as exciting as a comic book. And uh, so that's a big deal, I think, with all of them. And that's with Iron Man. Oh, just sure. everybody was so strong. And I think, I mean, if you if you are making a film and uh, and and you make a mistake, you're going to make lots of mistakes when you make a movie. If you don't, if you, if you get the casting right, you can survive almost all the other mistakes. That's the one you can't survive. And I think that's that's really the secret sauce is is the the precision with which this guy can can put those characters with those actors. Do you have, because I imagine it'd be hard for you to say your favorites, Kevin, but do you have, do you have ones that you're most proudest of? Well, Avengers, of course, and, and Iron Man 1, and the ones that, the, all the ones that you just named, the ones that, that move things forward and, and surprise people and, and, and take us to another place. I would say a movie that I think is great and is aging, and it was actually one of our 
it was a hit at the time. You look back at it now, and it, and it didn't make as much uh, as the others. But I think it ages even better than any of the other ones, and it's the first Captain America film. Captain America, the first Avenger, is a great, great movie, and Evans, we talked about earlier. And that was the movie that we met uh, Jeff Ford on, and that, so much of that movie is, is Jeff, and the storytelling of that movie, and what, the way Joe Johnston shot that movie. Uh, and it, it, is, it, it holds up, and I think it's better and better, and I'd like to see it on sort of the iTunes chart. Every, like when Infinity War came out, it starts to go back up the, the sales chart, so people who haven't seen it are rediscovering it. Uh, and I think that holds up quite well and, and, gets, and gets better and better. And Stanley Tucci, uh, the Stanley Tucci scene with him in the, the barracks yeah. is maybe one of the best scenes. Which I got to write. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, was, I finally met him like when I was doing this uh, PSA about voting and I was I, I wrote your style of next year's stuff. <laughs> so, um, Captain America, I mean, he was so gracious. He was like, oh, what a fun time that was. Yeah, he's, he's just the most charming, lovely, open, on screen and then in person. Oh yeah, he's just that guy. Okay. Did you? Did you? I mean, it's a side note, but did I, I love that sort of aesthetic of the World War II stuff? Did you? Obviously, you were moving forward. Did you guys ever talk about maybe going back and doing another cap sort of set in that time period? With, with each of the Captain America films subsequently, The Winter Soldier and Civil War, we always start by saying we're going to do Godfather Two, and half of it's going to be in World War Two, and half of it's going to be, and we haven't gotten there yet. But the Winter Soldier was another one because I love the first one, and I was sort of when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, I'm kind of bummed they didn't like do a couple in World War II. But then Winter Soldier, I'm like, oh my god, it's the Fugitive. Like I, I love that movie. I encourage to you, Jeff, on that one. I, I think the action in that movie is amazing. Um, well, let's um, we got to let these guys go in a couple minutes, but we'll, let me take a couple questions from the audience. Yeah, this guy right here. Um, they're weirdly not that different. Um, uh, there's obviously, yeah, you, I mean, you, there's less interference. With Astonishing X-Men, the level of interference was you can't have Wolverine smoke a cigar anymore. Because <laughs> Disney. And uh, I was just like, oh, but, 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 god damn, my life is terrible. <laughs> the, um, the thing about uh, working at Marvel, and I think this is stayed true, I, you know, um, it, it really was the mom and pop blockbuster shop. Like, there wasn't like a dozen executives with a bunch of competing agendas. There wasn't somebody saying, let, 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 when we'll get Prince to do the music for both. It was just, like, there's, there's always that element of it. It's like, oh, for God's sake, what, what were they thinking here? And, and uh, it's, it's pretty much, it was Jeremy and Kevin, uh, and those were the voices I heard. And there were other voices, but part of what Kevin spent his time doing was taking them, listening to them, consolidating them, and bringing me so that I didn't have a bunch of different people. And, and so, you know, I, you, there's a lot of back and forth. And also, Kevin and, and Jeremy are also great storytellers. And I mean, like, came up with major plot points in both movies that I did. And I've worked with very highly paid writers who aren't as good at story as those guys. And so that was, I mean, they would come up with, you know, huge transitions, big moments, and just a lot of stuff that they don't get credit for. Um, so you're working with artists, you're, and you're all working for the same idea. You know, we knew what we wanted to do. Not everybody did. Like I said, the actors understood the basic concept, but sometimes some of my choices were a little baffling to them, I think. And, and, and uh, um, a lot of the crew, I mean, some of the crew didn't also hadn't read the script. Like we, we we did three weeks on the helicarrier, and then a camera assistant came to me. She's like, I just I, I just gotta ask, are we in space? <laughs> <laughs> I like that it took three weeks to get there. Um, and I'm like, not that I know of. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, so it it we you know, not every step is a step forward, but. But it really starts to when you're in the background feel like that because um, because we were all trying to do the same thing. We were trying to make the book where every time you turn the page, something lovely or surprising happens, and that's the other thing about comic books specifically. When you turn the page, 
you always have an opportunity because you have like 11 opportunities to make people go, oh shit, or make them cry, or make them, you know, to really create a moment. And so you just want to keep hitting that. You don't want to like just taper off for a while. Oh, we have some good coming up. You sort of, you really you get that opportunity and, and you, you exploit it. And so honestly, that's the, the truth is they're not that different. You're just, you're just trying to, well, how does it, what is the best way this to work? Well, it looks like we have to go, so we'll take one last question. How about, um, yeah, you're right there. Um, yes, when I created Scott Johansson, I had to tell you. No, I uh, honestly, the, some of that comes from the comics. Uh, you're looking for what makes people different the whole time. I mean, that's a big issue. Uh, Colson's fanboying over Cap, which was the best thing that ever happened because he gave me the cards that just kept giving me payoff moments one after another. Um, came because everybody had the exact same sort of dry wit. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta ease off the dry wit. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Cap is famous in the 40s, we can do a thing. And Clark, of course, was, just kills that, he's so good. Um, with her, in the comics, there, were, there had been a lot of stuff, uh, more recent stuff, where they really stressed the fact that she was a spy. And that she was like a, you know, had a very dodgy past, and that she like had a darkness to her. And you know, you know going in that she's not gonna knock down a building like that's you know this with the action as much as anything. You're like, okay, I got the God of Thunder and bow and arrow guys. So <laughs> how do I make everybody matter? And this, to the, you know, and um, uh, with her leaning into that and sort of like her scene with Bruce and her scene with Loki and her scene with Loki is, was my favorite experience. <coughs> like that's probably my favorite scene in the movie and they just just kept crushing it and fucking Hiddleston I, I Hiddleston's in the movie more than anybody else like he had the most days of shooting because he's the one against six and uh, he what he did in that in that cell and was just so gorgeous and then he came out and I was like Tom that was I just I don't even know what to say it was just just extraordinary and he just goes mighty writing <laughs> I have a 14-year-old girl now. <laughs> and, um, so with yeah, and, and with her, it was just it was really it was really like play into the idea that and that scene particularly that that there is damage in her that she can't control. Ha ha, fuck you. I am in control of it. But then the scene with Hawkeye is like yeah, except it is there, and to be able to, you know to have that from the comics, you know, there's a very rich legacy. There's a lot of stuff you gotta leave behind, but in that case, that's what really informed it. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. We have two more films in this series. Uh, next week, Guardians of the Galaxy with right. Kevin, and right. the back, and James John, the writer director. And then our last film in two weeks, which is now gonna be on uh, June 6th, on Wednesday, we're gonna be doing Black Panther with a whole ton of people. It's gonna be a great closing night. So. Anyway, let's have a big round of applause for these guys. Thank you. Thank you. We still go on to save your seats for a bit while we let these guys leave. Thank you. Thank you.